This is what I'm talking about. When data falls, your data, my data, by accident or leaks or whatever, somebody is responsible. Some entity is responsible. And that's what I mean by are we in some level of control, right? Welcome to the podcast of the Think Tank Decentrum. This podcast will cover a broad range of topics around decentralization and its impacts on society. Decentralization is not only blockchain and Bitcoin, it's much more. This is what we want to talk about. In the first three episodes, we'd like to present to you our advisor board. First, Monique Morrow. Monique is president and co-founder of the Humanized Internet, a non-profit organization focused on providing digital identity for those individuals most underserved. She's also an associated researcher at Alexander Humboldt University Institute of Internet and Society. Furthermore, Monique is co-chair of the IEEE Ethics in AI and Autonomous Systems Mixed Reality Committee, in addition to being a member of its executive committee. In the next roughly 60 minutes, we'll speak about the ethics of autonomous systems, on digital identities, and on how decentralization will shape our society. We, that's me, Mirko, your host, Anna, our internal expert in political and philosophical questions, and of course, Monique Morrow. When I did my research for this episode, I realized pretty quickly that people matter to you, even though you did start as a network engineer and manager. In 2001, you became Cisco's CTO consulting engineer for the service provider segment in Europe and Asia. And a couple of years later, you were promoted to service CTO. Um, so the service business and thus helping other people and companies was and still is important to you. Mm -hmm. um, Uh, but first things first, you studied French and European history. I, I would say this is not the usual way for a technical career. How can you move into network? And how, well, that's the, well, first and foremost, the, this is a very common question asked. How is it that a CTO or a distinguished engineer managed to uh, achieve such a position in a technology company given what in my case, what I studied. And it goes to an earlier conversation we had is the importance of this intersectionality between technology and computer science, et cetera. But if we look at T equals time, the time, um, the sky was a limit or has been the, had been the limit in terms of people entering into the internet uh, era, era. And so it was rather, rather new. I mean, if I look at the mid 80s, uh, early 80s, when I got into this space, Uh, there were no really big predecessors other than the ones that you've heard of. So um, it was open. I was in Silicon Valley. And it was open for, for me to actually take the, the next steps. And so uh, I fell in, love with the, the fa fell in love with technology. If I take a step back, I mean, my, my aspiration was to become a diplomat. Um, and uh, you graduate uh, with such a degree in Silicon Valley. At the time, there was a deep recession. I think this, this is the cyclical times that we see. And so uh, here I am, and it's, there's no way that you were going to actually, nobody was ever going to look at a resume or CV uh, like mine. And so it was important uh, it here, was accidental. So I call myself an accidental engineer. Uh, it was, in most cases, what you see is who you know. Right, that that's the network effect. Nobody is going to take a look at somebody's CV and say you are the right person. It's how you present yourself or how somebody who knows you. And in this case, it was uh, a person who happened to be a family friend who was an economist by training, and fundamentally said, "Look, I'm in this uh, space at a, a company called Advanced Micro Devices. We have something called, uh, you know, this engineering data center. We think you could. I think you could be part of this, um, and you can learn this." And learning, so I interviewed in a very, very, very conservative company, semiconductor company, uh, you know, advanced micro devices, um, and engineering data center, the customers were the internal device physicists, the people who were making these little microcircuits and chips. And I uh, got the job. And so what kinds of technology was I dealing with at that time, which dates myself? Um, basically, it was IBM, big machines although I think we're going back to it. But anyway, big machines. And really date myself, they were called punch cards. <laughs> so now, I mean, these are stuff that you see in, in museums. And, um, 
And there was nothing called distributed, you know, uh, campus type of networks. They were bridged networks. Um, and there was a big gorilla. So you had IBM as a big gorilla. You had this company called uh, DEC as a big digital equipment corporation as a big gorilla. They bridged packets. And uh, so you had all of these big gorillas. And so in terms of distributed networking, in terms of uh, routing protocols, that was relatively new. So it was timing. So timing, who you know, who you know, very, very big. The um, hunger to learn, really important. And, uh, and I did. And so, and so there was a little company, really, really little company called Cisco Systems out of what was then Menlo Park. These were students out of Stanford University, not even a public company. And um, I thought, gosh, these people are interesting. So the story gets bigger, but I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of where the launch pad was. All right. Wow. <laughs> but I think the diplomatic part of your career or you want to become a diplomat is still kind of big because now you're speaking like to the whole world and it listens. I mean, in 2016, you were under this Business Worldwide Magazine Visionary of the Year. Mm -hmm. um, so your mission, as it seems, is to use new technologies to the greatest advantage of global society. And mm -hmm. um, what are the greatest needs at the moment which could be solved by technologies? Right. So that's a great question. Um, well, the diplomatic part is always going to come to play. That, let me just say this, whatever you do, because you have to convince people. Um, uh, you have to be able to, to have uh, to look at where compromise is. So that's, that, that degree never went out the door. That was actually, it's been a strong point for me. So if I fast forward to today, um, one of the big concerns that I have, especially when I talk about the humanized internet, is this notion of technology itself and, and, and agency. Um, the issue is around ethics. Uh, it was an earlier conversation I had uh, with uh, some people, and, and part of, of what I do with IEEE ethics and autonomous and intelligent systems, because the, the stakes are so great uh, now than ever before. Uh, so uh, when I look at technology, so on one hand, we have a polarity, uh, a polarity between what we'll call these, these tools of mass empowerment uh, with, with tools of potential mass destruction. So uh, we have to actually look at uh, how we embed ethics in anything that we do without, it, uh, without uh, technology overtaking you. I do strongly believe that the human must be in the loop. I do strongly believe that we need to recognize uh, and respond to cognitive bias. Um, I do strongly believe that, uh, you know, when, when we have facial recognition, when we have um, facial recognition that goes awry, uh, such that it doesn't recognize your face anymore, it puts you into some other pool, perhaps a criminal, uh, or in China where uh, facial recognition is the norm because they're actually looking at you um, and uh, you are watched. So there's this craving now, uh, could be craving for privacy. One thing uh, when I look at the humanized internet is the internet as we know it is being controlled by, this is not, um, this is a fact, it's being controlled by fewer and fewer organizations. And so it's no longer this sort of gr internet as we, we grew up with, which was really truly, you know, decentral, quote, de not owned by anybody, if you wanted to call it that. But on the other hand, um, the internet, if depending on which country you sit in, would be, well, that was a a United States defense experiment, which it was. And so therefore, nobody has a trust factor in it. So we need to bring trust back. So to, to let me just go back to the real, uh, distill it a little more. Ethics and trust are, are very, very important. We need to ask ourselves the question, how is this technology being used by consumers? What is the potential for abuse? We need to be asking constantly these questions. The fact that, the fact that I'm uh, making selfies of myself, who knows what will happen of that. Of that. Uh, can somebody actually do sex torsation with you and actually say, oh, we have a picture of you, and also uh, let's put the picture and kind of uh, deem it up a little bit juicier, and then your privacy and your reputation is tainted. That is the power that we, uh, people have to destroy you, and so uh, people and in uh, in 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 groups. So we need to uh, actually look at um, you know. I'm not saying to cut off yourselves from 
public from, from your digital footprint, but understand whether or not, and here's the big, big, big problem that we need to solve. Are you in control of who you are and your digital footprints on the, on media? Um, do you know what, uh, how technology, uh, how groups are using the technology to profile you? Do you know um, how, uh, without your knowledge, right? Um, and I think this is important, uh, the reason why Germany, for example, has the strictest law uh, in, if I say GDPR, this whole notion of, uh, you know, this whole notion of da uh, general data privacy, is that is because of its history with, uh, with the Nazis at the time. And the Nazis, what they did, specifically the SS, is that they worked with a precursor of IBM. Uh, it was the Hollerath tabulator. We went back to punch cards. And they actually were conducting a census. And that was based on ethnicity. That's why in France they no longer use ethnicity. It's just gender. Uh, who you were uh, by religion, who you were, where you were born. And they knew exactly where people were. And so that, this is a sad history in, in, in the mal, maluse of technology, but it could be worse. And so, uh, you know, uh, we think of, on the other hand, it's the, the greater part, because I don't want to be so dystopian, but the greater part is I could be my, I could use these sets of technologies to start doing some notion of self-diagnosis of diseases such that I can come back to the doctor with intelligent questions to ask and no longer give my faith in a medical doctor, but actually start to challenge the doctor. After all, I am the patient, I am his cu or her customer. And so those are the things that I think uh, that we need to pay attention to. Just like to prevent that technologies couldn't be used against you, but would serve you like to the greatest advantage. Exactly, right? okay. exactly, exactly. Mm. Sad. You were speaking um, about the IEEE um, mm -hmm. earlier. So you're a co-chair there for the ethics in AI and autonomous systems, like especially for mixed reality, right? Yes, mixed reality. Yeah. Can you tell us something about your work with the committee? What, what exactly right. so, are you Right, so a group, so my other co-chair is Jay Iorio from uh, Southern California. He's a futurist with IEEE. So we have a, a very interesting group of people in, in, this, uh, in this group of mixed reality. Um, they're questioning whether or not we should call it all reality, but... Um, the thing of it is, is that here you're looking at, uh, there are physicians. Uh, could I use this technology to treat you medicinally of, of trauma? Um, and the answer is yes, right? I mean, that's, that's one. Could I use it to, to uh, treat somebody or to uh, treat somebody who has dementia? Not treat, but actually treat dementia or uh, somebody who has Alzheimer, where you bring back a moment of memory and music. And, and watch that person go back in time because it's experiential. And the thesis is that that which is experiential is stays with you longer. You know, so or take a look at uh, children who are autistic. Um, and so there's there's really powerful modes of this. On the other hand, um, the so the, that's the ethic. The, the ethical part will be: Could I overtreat you? Um, could I? That you're so immune to to trauma. What do you mean by overtreat? So, so could I treat you such that you're immune to trauma? And you may say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, okay. So in the sense that you, like, you, you stay become, in virtual reality. You stay in you virtual reality. Exactly. Like, you, you stay in a world. And this is a very good point. You picked that up. Super. You stay in a world that you no longer want. That is your reality. You no longer want to leave, leave that world. Now, the problem, so there are several things that happens. Uh, you're in this world. I don't want to leave it anymore. Um, and uh, from a legal perspective, that's why we have lawyers get involved in the program, is uh, what happens, especially in gaming mode, because we see this all the time, what happens if I use your identity, I co-opt it, um, and you don't know it, and I actually commit murder. I actually kill you. Now we're in this world, and we can see the. No, no, no. But the, but you can see it. We're in this world, and I'm and you're living it. Now, do you report it? And because because you can say, is that such a game? Or if it, I become I, I and these could be other avatars because we live in modes of avatars, right? And so, at which point uh, do you say, hey, look, this this we need to put guns here. We can't kill each other. Uh, or do, what happens, right? So, and because what happens is, is, as long as you're extending beyond the point of what is allow, what you think is allowable, how do you? W w at which point? What is law? What does law look like? That's number one. Number two is, 
Um, do, do we become so programmable that we lose randomness or serendipity? Do you have to put a serendipity button on or off? Right? Yeah. Now, if I'm wearing, if you look at Facebook or any of the other groups, are these really glasses now? You don't know. My lens is really contact lenses. I'm actually looking at you and I'm going, yeah, I can see. So you don't know. So there's, 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 I want my serendipity button on because I don't want to be programmed. That's one part of it. The other part of it is I want my privacy button on. I don't want you to see it, see me, or see uh, instantiations of me. And if we go further in the thesis that our brains become software, how do you define death? So these are types of conversations we're having. Theologians are part of this conversation, too. All right. So if I understand you correctly, you're trying to setting standards, right? Mm. Or is it... There are standards. There's a standards track on, on, on privacy. It's called the P7000 series. But are they sufficient? That's the question. Well, no. Is, I think, okay, you can have standards for standards, but what is sufficient people? You can have, it's like rules. You can have rules, but people break those rules. I mean, from the ethical point of view. They could be. Um, I mean, not, there's, there's not going to be sufficient. They could, well, they provide a little bit of gates, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you can go back and say, okay, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about that. And so here's a standard. I mean, I have some people who are in the privacy world, and they, they're, they're all over this space, right? The thing is, is that you're defining hum humanity in a different way on, on one side. And on the other side is, uh, are they sufficient from an ethics point of view? Well, we're putting the flags in space in place. So you can actually look. It's open to you to take a look at it. It's a common, you know, um, uh, view of the documents. You don't have to be a member of IEEE. Uh, and it's constantly being updated. So these are people who are looking at it with a strong ethics a lens on and to create a standard track, which nobody has ever done before. Um, so, and, and it's being extended into universities. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, about a month ago, I was crossing a street. I was here in Zurich, and a group of guys were coming out. They were, uh, for me, technologists, because they were talking about the standard ethics question. Should the trained driverless car hit the elderly lady, or should it hit the, the, the one that you presented with, or the, the, or the woman with a uh, pregnant woman with two children? And they were laughing. They said, um, ah, it's the elderly woman. She lived longest. But I counter that. Why should a driverless car hit anything? Right? Why should some? Why should this be a zero sum game? Right? How could it be instead? How could it? Well, um, so uh, first of all, I think entities. When you see those two people crossing a street as a driver, you don't make that choice. You stop. You, as the driver, the human driver stops unless you're drunk or something. Uh, that's where. So I'm putting the human back into the loop here, right? And this just gets into the dangerous thing about algorithmic decision making and human rights. Well, uh, let the let the hu human just relax. Well, that's not the choice here. How would you feel? Look at what happened with the with a dry, uh, driverless car that hit a had a, a, lady, a female cyclist, and I think in in Arizona. How do you feel being a passenger in that car? You're going to walk away forever thinking about that moment, yes, right? True. So my point is it shouldn't be zero sum, and a human should always be involved in that decision making. Think about it also from an airline perspective. Yes, you've got, uh, you've got it all automated, et cetera. But at some point, the skills of an air um, a pilot have to come and play, and we've seen those scenarios before where he or she has never been tested along those lines, and it's beyond what a computer can do. So that's, and computers, the thing of it is, algorithms know what they learn, what they learn. What about the unknowns? And that's where we have to be very careful about machine learning. So for example, one last point, because this is a really hot point for me. I met uh, the head of um, artificial intelligence at Volkswagen in Munich. And what he wants to do is look at how he can tackle um, AI and machine learning for good. He's very concerned about it because his lifelong training as a researcher has been in this space. And good for Volkswagen for hiring somebody like him. But he was here in Trust Square, and we walked through a scenario where he was showing me what machine learning looks like when you put woman in the learning space, rape, housewife. 
And he said, it's not because that's what comes up, rape, housewife, you know, you can, you can, you can actually start testing for that. And what he said was, that's not the algorithm itself. For you, as a political scientist and a social scientist, it is the reflection of our society. Yeah, that's pretty true. I mean, this is also the, the huge debate between can technology be neutral or not? Yes. It's always embedded in a biased society, right? We're all infected. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, you're raising these questions and I really feel your intrinsic motivation behind it. But would you also think it's kind of a duty of those people working in the industry and making these huge innovations to reflect on these I questions. absolutely, everyone is responsible. It's yeah. not just the people who participate in IEEE. It's the enterprisers, it's the organizations that may be, uh, name your favorite company uh, involved. It may be, name your favorite university involved. It may, it's every one of us are going to have to be responsible, not just an organ one organization. Yes, it could be taught, but you need to, so here's the point. It, it, can, it doesn't take much to taint your brand. If I say Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, and that's just the tip, right? If I say Swisscom and my data, I was affected, fell in the hands as a VIP customer, the third party. Okay? Now what happens is who's responsible? I don't know. Look at the Bundesverfassung because I think a law was broken here. My data uh, in Switzerland fell into a third party's hands, okay? And uh, what Swisscom's response to me was, uh, don't worry, uh, you know, you can go here and you can put this button now, and this you button. you think this for button. one minute, uh, somebody didn't come back and say, we'll give you a discount or we're so sorry, or, you were affected. And by the way, everybody was talking about post and what happened there, but I think so, a law was broken. And we don't have to put our hands up. This is the thing that, this is what I'm talking about. When data falls, your data, my data, by accident or leaks or whatever, somebody is responsible. Some entity is responsible. And that's what I mean by are we in some level of control, right? So no, to answer your question, it's not, it's not, I'm not sounding like a Cassandra. I'm in the space because I believe strongly in it. Uh, I'm in this place because I, I am a technologist and I know how data, it used to be said that, uh, uh, you know, data is, 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 is oil, right? That was a, sort of the mantra. As long as I had your data, uh, I, I've been in those organizations, I knew how to monetize it, right? Well, as you, are pro you become a product. You are a product. It's never for free. And so, and so I think, uh, I think it's also like who, how is all of this being used responsibly? And I have friends at all the companies I've mentioned, but if it's, it, it, one after another tainting of, 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 uh, or reputation of your brand, it doesn't take much. And that's the thing. That's how, that's the, how high the stakes are these days. And, and when I get into the other part of the technology, um, there is a there is a video. It was sort of a futuristic video, but it's one. It's, it was one where, again, you know, you're talking about ma mass empowerment versus mass uh, destruction. Was called slaughterbots. These little bots are just created, and they go off, and they go, and they attack you. They just pick up, and and I can actually I can do that and say I'm going to attack a university. And nobody's in control anymore. It's sort of this very, very futuristic uh, kind of uh, Orwellian thing. Uh, in fact, it was shown uh, for people who were looking at, hey, gosh, we've got to be careful of this technology. It was at an extreme. But, you know, is that spider, if I look at it, if, um, if I don't like you and I create my little drone that looks like a spider and it has anthrax and it's in your, in your shower, you would never know. That's crazy. You're yeah. talking a lot about this kind of control yeah. And the fear that we are losing control about our... It's a flag. Maybe okay. also like losing control over our identity yes. or over our um, persona. But what are your suggestions to like gain back the control over, over I our think identity? That, um... I think that uh, so so gain back the control is is one thing. It's also looking at you know your digital footprint and how much you're willing to share. So one one example that we have to look at is, um, you know, uh, having 
having a digital trezor of what it is we want to have in our trezor, um, so that becomes extensions of ourselves. Uh, where you and your closest family may have keys and and uh, they they're ephemeral, right? That's 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 kind of a digital instantiation. I think on the th- level of control, I think what's happened is that uh, we're the minute we put ourselves out there, I think we're 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 never going to have full. The argument is we're never going to have full full control. But perhaps the counter argument is we hold people responsible or organizations responsible if they're using our identities in a way we never allowed. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, we're working, uh, so so there's a company here in Switzerland called personaldata.io, uh, made the press quite um, recently. In fact, they were with uh, Christopher Wiley, Paul Olivier de Hay, who is living in, uh, in Lausanne, Geneva, um, in terms of how your data is actually used. Um, his first... The belief was the first customers would be the members of the press because they're the ones that are most exposed, right? And he actually, he's got this AI bot called Chami, and you can actually say, Chami, tell me about Monique Morrow. And you can find, it was, it was actually an interesting thing, you can find ex- exactly, you can find actually an extrapolation, what's legally allowed, of who, where the, your digital footprint is. So that's one area, at least you find out. The but other one, politics should be more radical. I'm not sure if politics should be more radical. It's uh, so, you, so at least you have some level of. So let's take that question up. The answer is there's a technology solution to find out, right? You can find out. Number one. Number two is when there is a use or misuse, which organizations do you hold up their feet? Where do you go? Where do you have a, a chance to say I, I. I am going to uh, unclog it or whatever. I'm going to take you on legally, right, because of what you just did. And uh, let me give you the example of uh, the example I had with Swisscom. Nobody was throwing their arms in the air and saying, I feel philetzed, mm-hmm. except me. Mm-hmm. I-, I mean, seriously, I have read my Bundesverfassung, and I think that's an interesting space. Then it gets into the space, if you're studying pol- uh, political sciences, what is l- what do you call about regulation and technology without stifling innovation? Because we're in a new, new era now. Because we can, we can over-regulate and over-stifle that anything you do is against the law, which is not what you want. And so that goes to the skill sets of computer scientists and a lawyer and, and so on and so forth. And to ask these questions about what happens. How do I know everybody's talking about fake news? Everybody's talking about um, uh, launching attacks through cyberspace. Uh, and, and that's a new ground for warfare, actually. But you don't know how to set attribution to it. You know, when somebody throws a bomb uh, uh, or whatever, you, uh, a bomb, an explosive, you can at least say it came, we think it came from that source because they just launched it, right? But in the cyber world, how do you know? How do you know? This gets into bot versus bot versus bot versus bot. So these are the things, we're living in a different type of modality. It's not to scare people so much as to wake up and say, You know, one day you wake up and you don't know, and to be able to ask those questions. I mean, in the university, to be able to ask those questions as a society, to be able to ask the question about, um, you know, what's going on with my phone? What are you tracking about me? Why do you want to know my location? Why do you want to know X, Y, Z, right? Maybe that will help if I'm stuck in a cave. I don't know, but provided that you have uh, access, right? So. But do you think that... Or aren't we already too late in like this whole time? Like right now, we could be spoiled. I mean, we could be, they have, they have all our data. Yeah, but do you think, they do. Um, is it possible to, to stop them collecting our data? Who's them? Like, all, let's say Google, let's say Facebook, let's say Amazon, let's okay. say Swisscom, all the companies that, that you, you've also mentioned. And to stop them collecting our data sure, and yeah. still live like the life that we live right now 
Wait. No, it's a great question. So I, there's a video to watch, actually, with Brian Schmidt uh, from Google, ex-chairman of the board of Google. I don't know if it was like 2010 or 2011, uh, where uh, he said it was a very kind of a scary uh, part where he said, we will know your next move. Be- we will think your next thought before you do. Now, um, you know, has Google become your mind? Has Google become your heart? Has Google and Facebook? Well, not yet. <laughs> not, not yet. But, you know, I mean, so we the thing of it is, is that uh, what's happening is there's a backlash, which is a good thing. I mean, so Google had this um, had this mantra um, there. Do no evil. Right. So they're, they're mit- or by it, so the employees are comfortable in saying we don't like you, Google uh, and the staff. And Facebook did the same in doing business with the Defense Department, right? We don't want that. We stand by now. But on the other hand, they are, we are products, right? So they want to, that's how they monetize you. Um, and so, so I think of it is, is that uh, I think Google has a chance or Facebook has a chance perhaps to put then their ethical button in place, whether or not people believe that, I don't know. But uh, is it too late? I don't think it's too late. I think it's now uh, dependent upon us to say, hey, look, uh, and by the way, the GDPR laws here are strict in Europe. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. They can still get around that. That's another study to look at is how they get around it, is, 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 is that. And so um, you're watched by, you know, your, your, your data, you are just so profiled in terms of print that's out there. But I think it's the question to ask, how much is it? No, that's the example of the, the function personal data.io is not about me. By which organizations are not about me. Did I know about these organizations that knew X about me? I didn't know that. What is profile, being profiled? When I said, uh, you know, um, there are uh, tools out there. There's a company called HireView.com. And look at the companies who look HireView. Uh, I do a video uh, interview with you. do a video interview with me. It's your company. Um, but you're doing behavioral analytics at the same time. You're collecting the data. You may say she's lying. You may say she's having a bad day. What's being done with that data? And does the person know you're doing that? The person may be einverstanden or agree to it because he or she wants a job or at least interview. How far are you willing to go for that? (laughs) Seems like we're living in an evil world. (laughs) No, I don't. No, no, don't get me wrong. And here's the thing. We probably have been all going through these spells. We just weren't cognizant of it. But I say that because the stakes are very, very high, right? And so um, and let me just say there are mis- there is power in technology. It's so powerful uh, that you give a phone the power that's in that smartphone to a child. Now, I don't know about you, but when I had to drive a car, I had to take a driver's test. I had to take a theoretical exam. I had to take a... Should we not be having those levels of conversations about the uses of technology before you even buy it? So to say, this is what its use is. This is what we're doing. The Swisscom go over. I know because I used to work at at these companies. Do they go and say, by the way, um, we're going to do this with your data? They do this long, 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 and then you. It's called this sort of this sort of click. um, We'll call it a clickbait, right? It's sort of this click. And in fact, you are held hostage because you can't get to a service, but you're held. And so where does that serve in, the, in, in, in law? And the answer is it could be challenged, right? It could be challenged in, in, in a legal forum because you never had a chance and had recourse to do uh, anything otherwise because they were holding a technology hostage. Uh, you know, they were holding it. So you could argue a very, very interesting things from a legal perspective, right? But people are willing to go, okay, I agree, I agree, I agree. And then you go back and you go, what the heck did I just agree to? But I'm still interested how you think technology could be used in order that it serves humanity. So I think, uh, for example, um, one of the things I, I, I love is the fact that you can become your own healthcare provider. I think that's very, very important. I think that uh, uh, using a mobile phone to, di- to use do some level of diagnosis is really very cool. Um, I think that's very uh, important. I think you can actually use these uh, the, the technology to control who has access to your data from a physician's perspective to say, I don't trust Dr. X, but I trust Dr. Y, and I will give Dr. Y permission. Then you're in control, and then that's a great use of technology in a sense 
from a healthcare perspective. And, and, it's, and it's being done today uh, to some extent, to a little bit of extent, extent in Estonia. So that's not something that is theoretical, right? And all that I've talked about to the point are realities. Okay, they exist. These problems exist. So it's dystopian, but they exist. The other part is, could I use technology to um, manage, uh, could I use technology to, to manage uh, climate change and water? Could I use technology, for example, uh, I'm, use, I'm working with uh, one of our colleagues here in, in Zug, uh, Vol Validity Labs, to look at blockchain and the Internet of Things, right? Could I use that to, if we have sensors in our, in, 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 in our, space, in our space here to manage the, the way we use air conditioning, to manage all of that? And then, of course, you would have... Um, you'd have a reward system because we, we need to have this sort of reward to get certain coinage or maybe you get your you get a, a discount off because you're doing great things with, with the, the technology. Could I use it for children? That's another thing that uh, Val Val um, Validity Labs is looking at, blockchain and Internet of Things for children. Could I create wallets uh, for children uh, who, who want to, instead of adopt a puppy or adopt a cat, uh, why not I work with a particular school here in Zurich or in Zug? Let's take Zurich. Why not uh, give uh, involve the? Ch of course, you would involve the parents because you want that child to learn the responsibility of of owning a pet. So you have sensors in a particular t uh, zoo or a place that you're working with. Um, you have uh, cameras there, and you create digital wallets for these animals, and that you you're as a child are learning to program that and you're watching when it has food and you're watching what it has, um, you know, when it goes to see the tier R, so the veterinarian, et cetera. That's a really good use. Those are real cases as, as we see it. Could I use technology, for example, where I'm, where I care about my own energy consumption in my home? Uh, not just because I'm going to get a discount from, from Aved said, but if I have, this is microgridding, if we're in, in several buildings together and we have uh, solar paneled, um, do, you know, uh, rooftops, and um, I have energy, and I'm showing, saying, look, I have, a, I have more than I need, and I trade with you and we're, you're giving me currency, wouldn't that be interesting? Right, those are the types of things where you're quite involved, which are powerful uses of technology. And the very last thing is um, one of the things I'm just throwing this out. Could I use technology to, um, if you're going to the University of Zurich and we're living here in Switzerland, how come we don't? How come your certificates and your degrees are not hashed on blockchain? We could talk about that a lot, but it's not done. Mm -hmm. Well, or one yet. <laughs> Yeah, or one way to use these new technologies are to defend the rights of vulnerable people and give every human being worldwide security. Let's talk about that. Control over Thank their you. own you digital that, identity. You let that. You so you let that in. So let's talk about yeah. that. Yeah. So one of the areas that uh, uh, that I'm very concerned about um, working and um, just on a call, t several calls today. Uh, been to Jordan. Been to you know worked uh, on behalf of. Um, hosted with UNHCR and the Annan Foundation, is how we use these sets of technologies to, for the caregiver, caregivers, for example, to actually give them a certificate, credentialing and certifying uh, their credentials because their papers have been destroyed at the University of Aleppo or wherever, that they can work. They want to work. They have dignity, right? This is beyond Maslow's law. You, have, you're, you want to work. You want to donate to your society. And by the way, uh, it's in the Human Rights Declaration if you haven't read that. Your right to work. Now we can go talk about that in terms of ageism, but that's another topic. Um, we haven't moved beyond that topic yet in, in Switzerland and many parts of Europe uh, where you're forced to retire, but that's another thing. Having said that, uh, when you don't have an identity, when you don't have something that says, this is who you are, my name is, and it's a paper, uh, you fall or you go through immigration and they say you're not in the system. Have you ever felt lost? When you take that paper out, it's lost. You are subjected to many things that are nasty. One of them is human trafficking. Human trafficking is the second greatest um, lucrative illegal industry next to drug trafficking. And it's happening every day. And children and women are most vulnerable. 
And so it's important to have that identity, but it's also important to look at what happens if we can keep a digital repository of it. Because there are situations where what happens, I've seen that in Asia, where or you come, you're coming from a said country, I take your passport, your physical passport, and you can never leave the country, and I force you in the streets. But if you had a digital instantiation of it, nobody could do that unless they had a gun to your head. And by the way, they were div- that would send out sensors, you know, send out alarms. Those are the types of things. But how would you do that? I mean, I could like imagine you have your identity on the blockchain and then you have kind of your wallet on your smartphone, you have your private key. I mean, if someone takes away your phone. I wouldn't have, have my identity on the blockchain. Okay. I definitely wouldn't store that level of uh, detail on a blockchain. But which institution would be in charge then? You would have it. This is yet to be invented, right? Um, this is what I presented at the uh, think tank event. I think that what we need to think about is that you have some level of a safe uh, trezor that only you and have, have the keys to, and it's not stored in anybody's central cloud. It follows you, and it has a real-time map of steel, which we near real-time. We don't know that what that could look like yet. And so I think that's an, yet to be invented, right? Yet to be developed, uh, which I think would be uh, something to, to think about. And digital keys, uh, just as I have to go to a bank, you have a key, I have a key, somebody has to have keys, right? But could I give keys sets to my own and keys as you would? following my death or whatever, uh, and there will be sent um, notifications sent. Um, Monique has just passed away. You're the next, you know, uh, of kin or something to that effect. This is yet to be invented, but I, I think that those are sort of the areas that we could go for. And for the person who is a Rohingya, the, if you your homework is to watch, if you haven't watched it, uh, Human Flow. That's a documentary uh, by Ai Wei. Um, Wei Wei, who um, is a Chinese um, activist artist who lives now in Berlin, and it took him a couple of years to do that film. And he went everywhere. What he's, what you're seeing is we are flowing. We're just migrating. We're just re- waking up. We've been doing that for years. Um, I'm here. You could be in California. And there are forced conditions. Well, maybe it's war. Maybe it's because of climate change. More often it's just climate change, and so on and so forth. And so... Um, He interviewed uh, some Rohingyas, and they said, please don't call us stateless. We're people, right? So they don't like to be called stateless. That's just an, a legal attribution to them. And uh, many of them do have phones. And um, so it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's the flow. And I'm not talking about world citizenship. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking about how you have something that could be a digital instantiation of who you are, how it is a, a, something that's legally binding that you can take through when you need to, you know? But, but which organization would be in control of something? I mean, there is yeah. the, the word control. It's actually wrong because well, you no, don't want so, to have... A, a no, you're too, so I'm looking at this notion, which is very difficult because, uh, it, you know, if you study Kant, you've studied Kant. I did, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you have to look at uh, what becomes... Uh, This, uh, what is, what, again, it's not world order or world citizenship, but it's also looking at sovereignty and how sovereignty is defined, mm -hmm. right? And what does e-sovereignty look like? Because e-sovereignty is, is where you're owning that set of uh, papers, right? You may have to flee. Look at the people in Bali or whatever. They're tourists. Probably they lost their passport. Is there a Swiss consulate nearby? No. But what if it was something digital that you could actually say, yep. Go scan and here, here's my scanning, whatever it is that I have, and 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 it is accepted by certain authorities that you allow to share. So the the, the pr thesis is, could I, could we be living in a situation where I share with you what I want to share, or if I need to share, right? Have, need, want, right? And so, it and it could be, if you think about the way the internet it works, you know, you have domains, .ch. .de, etc. If I'm forced to leave a country, let's say Switzerland doesn't like you anymore. If I'm forced to leave, could I take with me what I need to take and go up to another domain? Now, I'll take my, uh, my culture. I'll take my language. I'll take my love for Max Frisch or whatever. I'll take all of that with me, but 
but I was forced to leave. Right? And we need to think about fluidity. Let me give you a l real use case, a real use case also that is interesting to think about real-time apostille. So you know what an apostille seal is, right? Okay, um, it's real important because it's that official, official, the stamp. Okay, so the humanized internet is a Swiss-based uh, nonprofit founded in Zurich. And I have a co-founder who is based in Toronto, Canada, and one in Berlin. So my lawyers wanted um, Mark, who is my co-founder in Toronto, to sign a piece of the paper, and that had to have an apple steel seal from the Swiss consulate, no longer in Toronto. It had to be in Montreal, sent back. So the way it went like this, this is the 21st century, DHL Zurich. DHL Zurich Toronto. Toronto look at it, lawyers look at it, DHL Toronto Montreal to the Swiss consulate, boop, boop, boop. DHL back to Toronto, DHL Toronto back to Zurich. Excuse me, could we not do something better? Yeah, we should probably. And that's an example. That's a real example of what we, we need to know what a near real-time digital apostille could be by those sets of authorities, for example, right? By those sets of authorities. And I am not at all advocating for here is the world government and here's what we're looking at. The thesis here is that the institutions as we know, uh, know it, or is the question to ask, are they creaking? Is the United Nations great? Are they doing a great job? Is the, you know, so these are the things to think about. Are they creaking? Right, and so if they're creaking, then we have to look at what would be all, uh, alternative models that we could look at, given all the scenarios and the dynamics that we have in the background. I mean, somehow you have to attain this digital identity. Yes, and you ha you may have an autocratic state who will like relentlessly try to to prevent that. So you have it's already happened, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. And you have to have like some institution where they can go to. So, so there, that's so. So there are ten million people who are stateless, approximately ten. I think it's ten million today. So, so what is happening is they. You have in this particular example, they have flown. They they have gone to Bangladesh, which is, is this poor, is very very poor country, which is not going to give them papers. Right, so they're in no person's land. We haven't developed that institution yet. We don't know what that institution, other than UNHCR says, here's a paper. That's the triage that they have, and I know I've spoken with the UNHCR people. They can only do so much. We don't have, that's why I've asked the question, I consider, continue to ask the question, do the institutions we know and love today, are they sufficient for those kinds of cases? And the answer is no. Yeah, I wouldn't also. The answer is no. And so, and so, and so, and so, and there are two cases. Now I'm going to give you another sh shock. Um, I can force denaturalize you. This has just recently happened in one of the Indian states and Modi's government. And, and uh, what has happened is that uh, people who have um, Muslim as, uh, uh, religion are being denaturalized as citizens. And that has just gone up. And a case that has happened in the United States where a lady who has been a U.S. citizen, who has gone in and has gotten past the exams and done all the things, is being denaturalized. What happens then? Where do they go? We have to think about those scenarios right now. And so do you say now, um, now you have this flow that's happening right now, and we we have we have countries and you're not going to say countries no longer exist but countries are now choosing or have and they will to accept you not accept you will not um, deem you they will politicize uh, immigration they do they will create a crisis because they can which is a political narrative but you still are dealing with human people which is the start of our conversation and um, the thing of it is, is my thesis is that we're dealing with a, uh, a powerful, uh, what, it, what I will call a tectonic shift. So I don't know what the answer is other than pose the question. And, and I think that that uh, with, with 
the, the question being is the institutions as we know are creaking. Uh, technology can certainly be an enabler, but who is or actually how do you deal with uh, digital apostilles? By which sources of truth or semi-truth are we going to uh, validate? And who, what does a validating authority look like? Um, and they could be different validating authorities at the end of the day. So it's bigger questions than answers. I mean, the, and the answer is we're, we're working on it. We have to, we have to um, you know, look, we just won an award um, at the Institute in, in Berlin, uh, Advocate Europe, uh, with uh, Procevis, uh, Danny Dacieja's partner, in terms of looking at uh, this whole notion of uh, digital democracy, uh, digital, uh, digital identity in the future of democracy. So we're one of seven institutions that have won that award. Uh, and uh, now we're looking at this whole notion of randomized voting and what that could look like, at, or e-voting and randomized voting, and, and so on and so forth, in addition to this corridor of digital identity and the potential of what democracy can be. So would you say that like, democracy has to like, go all the way like, decentralized? or I think we're going to have a hybrid. Um, so that gets us to the centrum, <laughs> so, um, which is a great question. We, if we look at the complete decentralization where uh, entities are, if we look at just the DAO and how, what happened there where rules were d d by, created by the way code was, um, what happened there? Uh, uh, you had a situation where there was a hack. Uh, uh, no, I wouldn't even call it a hack. I would call it an exploitation of the code itself because mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. It's just, you know, I looked at the code, I looked at an exposure, and I actually thought I could do some of the good things about it. So you're talking about how governance is. We need to build more governance in the technology. We need to build more governance in the code uh, that we're dealing with. So I believe we'll deal with a hybrid, not a total decentralized, at least now, to perhaps decentralized, decentralized entities in the future. But the question is always going to be, do we have it in, in ourselves to, to, in our behavior, to be able to self-govern and un understand what self-governance is as human beings? We are, you know, um, can be the slaves of our own passions, right? So, and I think that's, a, that's going to be a, a, a scenario that we could look at. But I think to, to be totally decentralized, um, it, we can always think about the nobler goal, um, and maybe that would be the new order, right, of things in, in, the, in the future. But at this point in time, it'll be hybrided. How, yeah, how, how would such a hybrid look like? So a hybrid would be, uh, well, you can't throw the order that you have away, right? You still mm. have to, when you check in an immigration, there's somebody waiting for your little piece of paper. Um, so <laughs> you still have to deal with that level of order. On the other hand, you can say, look, we're going to, I mean, you, we need to experiment with parliamentarians. I mean, we need to experiment and say, look, can we create sort of a decentralized entity uh, at, a, at a government level or parliamentarian uh, or it, at a level? level in the content or at the level of an organization of this and, and to have that level of experiment and, and, and think about experimentation more than sandboxing, if you will. I'll give you an example of sandboxing uh, as countries, not just Estonia, because I think Switzerland has been doing some cool things. I think we need to give ourselves credit. Um, but certainly uh, Taiwan, I met uh, some people in Taiwan. Um, Ty I went a, a co congressman from Taiwan. And what Taiwan wants to do is create a, um, a corridor, a free zone corridor, um, where they're looking at, okay, this is blockchain, and um, actually give you a blockchain passport. Come in. Come play with us. You don't care if you're from Switzerland. Come play. That's interesting. That's interesting. That's not going to Zoog and saying, okay, I'm going to open a company, and it's registered in Zoog. It's come play with us. So, so... Could we start something in that space when we talk about regulatory going towards decentralized uh, at the end of the day? Because there are debates that are going on. Um, and I was in one of those debates. I watched a follow a debate where my colleague, Dr. Philip Sandner out of Frankfurt, was actually having a, um, a panel discussion, moderating a discussion with people who are have gone beyond. They're very, very wealthy in this cryptocurrency space. 
but they are also libertarians because they can be. But we have moved beyond, as a society, libertarianism. We are enterprising this, right? So this, that's the reality. So in Philip's German mind, he was trying to say, we need rules. And the counterpart was, why do you need rules? You don't need rules, right? Well, who decides what a red light or a green light is? And evidence-based, people will decide how that works. This is sort of this, this viewpoint, right? It was going back and forth. And uh, here's the quote of the, I tweeted this quote out. The person um, um, who was on the panel basically said, if I ever looked at uh, Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg, I would call him a data rapist because he's violating you. And I thought, wow. Um, that's it's interesting. pretty strong. That was mm-hmm. uh, well, it's very strong. Uh, but you can imagine this was a Korean Chinese audience and everything. But else, they were going, "Oh my God, what did they just hear?" Because you're they're hearing this this translation, and of course, you know that was the view, because he can be, right? He doesn't have to be, and he's out of New York. But uh, the thing of it is, where were we going with the conversation? We're going with, could you be allowing yourself to be self governed? And the thesis is, you should consider it very seriously, the centrum, else you'll be so regulated and so violated, uh, you wouldn't even know it, right? So we need a middle way at the start. So how would you think will decentralization um, affect society in the long run? Because you have mentioned some visions that in what direction it could go. I think we've made arguments about decentralization for the past, um, since 2008 to 2007 crisis. Why do you think not, uh, not, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's paper, which was yeah. built on previous research, by the way, 10 years before it was built, mm. uh, there was this financial crisis. I mean, I read the spider network about the LIBOR uh, uh, thing. I mean, these institutions that we know, um, uh, and and uh, I'm not saying they're all miscreant, but they are. Uh, they are. Um, uh, they're actually, um, you know, coached, not coached, but they're rewarded on risk taking, risk taking at your own, and it's still going on. This risk behavior, and so, too big to fail means too big. It just means too big. Yes. And 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 I'm sorry, my taxpayer money and your taxpayer money bailed this out. So, that's an example of where people went. Maybe we should be decentralized. And when a bank says, we are your bank of last resort, okay, what do you get an argument for? Okay, um, yeah, I had somebody, um, my, my bank uh, my I've got, my credit card was misused or whatever. That, that's a last, sort of a last resort. But read your e-banking statement very carefully. If it's hacked, you're responsible. Read it again. Read it three times, Okay. And I think that that's the thing that uh, when when they say we will bail you out, you have to be careful about the balance there. That's what I'm suggesting. Um, you know, again, uh, this was created. This this notion of peer to peer flow of value was created because of miscreate behavior, which is still going, unfortunately. And um, and I think that that's uh, that's that's uh, that's uh, that's the sad re- reality. Am I suggesting that banks will be totally eradicated? Absolutely not. Just as we uh, commence the conversation about email and the post, absolutely, there'll just be other alternatives. But this cat is already out of the box. It's like a pimple; you can't hide it. It's coming. It's here, right? And so we have to think about what, how can we best use these kinds of scenarios, that which is peer-to-peer, that which is decentralized. And by the way, nothing is totally decentralized yet. There will be nodes that points in the network where it is centralized, right? And so I think that those are the types of um, um, thoughts that we need to comprehend a little more. I actually have only like one last question. One last question, go yeah. for it. Is there one piece of knowledge or advice that you would like to share with our listeners? Um, yes, there is one one advice, and that is um, ask questions. You know, whatever it is you're using, ask the question. Great. What is it? What is Great. It? Thanks a lot for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. If you want to help others to find us, leave us a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform. 